Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you joining us for our webinar regarding information security tips. Um, I, um, we will, in the end, open it up for, um, with time permitting, our um, question and answer section in, or you can type in um, your question and answers in the, in the section above, or uh, type your comments in the chat section. Um, and um, I would like to introduce to you Brian Martin. He's our customer success manager here with me today. Hello, everybody. I'll be monitoring the Q and A and chat. So, and I'm Gina Guy. I'm the I'm a customer implementation manager here at Passageways. And I would like to also introduce to you Ross Moore. He is our cyber security support analyst, and he's going to be talking to us today about some information uh, or some security tips and and uh, regarding information in onboard. Thank you, Gina. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to start off talking at just the overview of the topics today. We're talking about passwords, two-factor authentication, and using onboard versus using email for distributing documents. The first two, we're going to do an overview. Uh, they're just a general InfoSec overview using passwords in 2FA. And uh, the, actually the latest April Ouch newsletter, if anybody subscribes to that, from the SANS Institute, uh, it's precisely about these first two topics, about passwords, password managers, and two-factor authentication. Back in oh, 1989, a famous rock climber, Lynn Hill, uh, she had reached 70 feet up uh, up on the rocks, up on this crag. And because she forgot to finish off tying her knot, uh, she fell. She survived, she was injured. Uh, just a few years later, another famous rock climber did much the same thing in a, in a climbing gym. He forgot to tie off his knot and he fell and he was injured. Uh, what causes something like this? Uh, so they're, they're professional rock climbers, they're published authors, they're teachers, and they had taught these things for years. It's, it's the simple things that we can, uh, that can cause troubles, even for professionals. So as you see in the quote on the side, complacency is safety's worst enemy. Uh, if you've ever done any kind of physical security, any kind of loss control, anything, this, this quote comes, comes to life in that too. So it's with security, it's much the same thing. Missing the little things can cause big problems. So the first two things we're talking about today these really are general topics. They're easy topics, and it can become easy to become complacent because well, we hear about it all the time. It's like uh, trying to figure out uh, you know, what's a great help, what, a great way for me to keep from being sick. And you'll see it all over the place. Wash your hands, and we get so used to hearing it that we don't think about it, and we forget it. We become complacent with it. So let's move on here, talking about passwords. So passwords, it's a, it's a good first line of defense. Right now we're gonna talk about doorknobs. May not seem to relate to passwords, but it will as we go along here. Uh, a doorknob is just a, a, a good general, uh, like, like here, a good first line of defense. Uh, doorknobs themselves, the, 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 they have a, a pin and tumbler, they have pins and tumblers, and depending on the amount of pins, the number of pins, will determine how, how uh, resistant they are to being picked, uh, the lock being picked. But one of, the, um, one of the drawbacks is the short latch. But we're just going to talk about the doorknob in and of itself. Uh, the doorknob lock in and of itself, it can be very good. It can have a lot of pins and be, be tough to lock, and that's, or tough to pick. That's similar to your password. Passwords are a good first line of defense. They're very good to have. The better your password, uh, the harder it is to crack, the harder they are to crack. It's only the first line of defense, but what I wanna talk about here is how to make that first line of defense better. Uh, depending on your company, your organization, depending on what policies you have, and especially thinking about onboard, like on, onboard doesn't link to your Active Directory. So you can't have any kind of technical policy 
for that, but you can have written or administrative policies. Onboard has a minimum set of requirements, for example, uh, the typical one uppercase, one lowercase, special character, minimum of eight characters, and a couple others. Uh, so that's minimal, but there's nothing to say that you can't tell your, your board members or having your policy, your coworkers, your employees, that they need to have a better password. So a couple good practices for passwords uh, for your written policies. One is to update your passwords on a regular basis. It could be every three months or six months, or even, it is, may surprise some people, even annually, and it all depends on your company's risk, uh, your risk appetite, your audit requirements, the security culture you have. Uh, but you wanna update them on a regular basis. Another one is don't reuse passwords. So uh, the reason, that's not just simply reusing it for you over and over in your own company, but across your uh, different, whatever platform you have. You don't wanna use the same password for your company that you use for your bank, that you use for social media. So why is that? Because if the bad guys get one of your passwords, then they're going to try it on other sites. They're going to try it on other accounts. For example, the LinkedIn breach back in 2012, that was uh, revealed in uh, between then and 2016, there were 167, that is 167 million credentials, uh, passwords and usernames that were breached. And then in 2016, 117 million of those were on sale uh, in the deep dark web underneath there. So if uh, they had one of those passwords, if they had your username and your password from LinkedIn, then they're invariably going to try it on various banking sites, various other places. So you want to avoid password reuse. We're going on to the next slide here and show you along these lines why you want to uh, avoid reusing passwords and you want to have good passwords. Uh, so what you see here is how do guys, how do bad guys figure out my password? So say the, the guys from uh, criminals for LinkedIn or any of these other things recently uh, that we've all heard about through the news over the last several years, they'll go in and they'll steal a bunch of passwords. And unless they're in plain text, typically they're not, but they, they break in and they steal all this, all this information. And what they see is what's called a hash. They have a hashed password. Now this table in front of you is a very simplified example of a pre-populated hash tables or a result of a, a rainbow table or cracking dictionaries. Now these are huge files, by the way. They can be 50, 70 gigabytes in size. But what they see, like you see on the left, they're going to, going to see a hash um, of your password. And what they have is they have pre-populated tables or they have algorithms that they can run and they'll run those basically they're hashes of all the commonly used passwords so anything like abc12234 password in all its variations you know you can do character substitution at the at symbol for a or zero uh, for a dope for an o anything like that and they have all of these in there and they'll run these calculations, and when they find a hash, like you see on the right, on the left-hand side, then they know what your password is. They'll have it, so they don't see your password, but they see the hash that you see there, that you'd see just example there on the left. So that's how they figure it out. So why have a stronger password? Why have a bigger password? Longer, stronger, uncommon password? They can only have so many, and they can only calculate so many uh, passwords and hashes in all of this. So if you have something like summer 2019 with an exclamation, they're going to have that. They're going to have spring, summer, fall, winter, all those variations, all the years. They're going to have sports teams, uh, celebrities. They're going to have the simple things like password or Apple or ABC123. But if you have a really complex password, it can be memorable, you can use a passphrase, then it's more than likely, it, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that it's in their table. So they won't have a hash for it, they won't recognize it, they won't know it. 
So I want to show you here on this next slide, as they go through these calculations, as they, oh, wait. As they look, as you think about it, as you think about, okay, what makes a, what makes a good password? How long should I make this password? Uh, what are the variations? What, what am I up against here when I'm making a password? So you, like you see here, password possibilities. Now this is from a, it's called Password Depot, and there are more calculations than this on the site. There's a link down there at the bottom of the slide. Uh, but let's just use the typical eight versus 12. So eight characters, if you have four lowercase, two special characters, two numbers, and go through the calculations down there uh, with a, a good strong password cracking algorithm, all the combination, if you have an eight character password as they try to crack it, try to figure it out, it could be cracked in about two and a half days. But if you up that to 12 characters and add a little bit in there, you see there are three upper, four lower, three special characters, two numbers, you have a whole bunch more possibilities. And to crack those passwords, it's gonna take approximately seven and a half million years with the current with the current uh, processing power for those so you see going just from eight to 12 characters for your password greatly decreases the opportunity that it would be cracked and of course if you avoid password reuse and you avoid the common uh, common passwords dictionary passwords some uh, simple dictionary words with um, character substitution you can have a really good password so you have a really good doorknob lock here. Uh, now, that's not all there is to it. That's not the only thing there is to security, but it's a simple thing and it's a simple and a straightforward thing to do. So now we're going into, uh, Gina's gonna show us some about how to manage passwords yeah, in yeah. Onboard. So now that you are all counting your characters and numbers and letters in each one of your passwords, let me take you over to Onboard and show you um, how easy it is to force a password reset. So if your organization, for instance, requires or, or is going to adopt um, intermittent password changes, you can come down here to your directory. Um, it's just on the left-hand side, it's a little people icon on the left. Um, and we are going to come over here to the members, to the individual members, um, you're going to go over here to the right hand side to click on the edit button. And um, let's go to, let's say, Dwayne Johnson. Um, let's go to Heidi Klum. We just have, a, uh, you didn't know, but we have a few famous people here, or at least their names are famous in our organization. Um, and just a few sample users that we like to um, uh, play around with. Um, but we are going to force them to reset their password. So we're going to come up here. We just clicked on this on the left hand side and we're going to click on reset password. Um, as you can see, it's loading and it says here that we are going to force the password reset for these individuals. So this is going to send them um, an email um, indicating to them that they need to reset their password in onboard or in the onboard portal. So that's a, it's as simple as that. Um, um, again, you just come over here to the members directory and hit edit and um, click next to their name and, and force the password reset. So let's turn it back over to Ross then for our next security tip. So we're moving on now to two-factor authentication. Uh, you'll hear it is two-factor or 2FA or MFA, multi-factor authentication. And they can be used interchangeably. Technically, 2FA, it, it usually just it means uh, something you know and something you have. Uh, MFA, it could also include biometrics, something you are, uh, but they're, they're interchangeable. If, if you see them, the, they all mean the same thing. So go back to the doorknob analogy. The, uh, so you have a good password. You have a good doorknob, all right? But the the password, the doorknob is not necessarily all that, all that strong. And of course, none of us would imagine having, protecting our house 
with just the doorknob with that little latch. We all, it's just commonplace now, we have a deadbolt. So what that does is, especially if you get really good ones, they're, uh, they have better pins, uh, pin and tumbler. Uh, they can still be, uh, they can still be picked, but they, they, there's a lot of things that are improvements in deadbolts. For instance, uh, some of them are uh, anti-drilling. You can't, uh, you can't bump them. They're very, very hard to pick. In fact, some are designed uh, so that they really can't be picked. But one of the main advantages is the longer bolt. So your doorknob goes into your your door frame, uh, maybe an inch, something like that. But with the with the deadbolt, it has that good solid bolt that goes way into your door, so that nobody can use a crowbar. Uh, with, if you just had a doorknob, it'd be easy to get a crowbar there in there. Uh, between your door and your door jam, the door frame, and open it. And it can't be done with a deadbolt. So this is where we get into 2FA. Two-factor authentication is a great way to increase and improve the security, especially with your password. Uh, it, so it's in addition to your password. Uh, if you can think of it uh, like door 2.0, Think of old doors long, long time ago. Maybe people didn't lock their doors. Maybe just had a doorknob. But we, even now, it's just accepted. We have the door, the regular door latch, and the door no, or the dead bolt. So it's gotten to the point where we really need anywhere you can. I would encourage you, just as a security person, uh, anywhere you can, turn on to it thing because it, it, it it's uh, it's it's just great. It really increases the security that you have. And this is not just simply for company. Now I know for companies, it can be very difficult to go with 2FA overall. It, it can be pricey, it takes a long time. But personally, if across the board, that you might have on uh, social media, anything like that, if you can turn on 2FA, that's great. So again, 2FA is something you know and something you have the first, something you know. Is your username and password? That's something you know. You put in, I put in R more and those seven dots, I can't, or eight, actually 12 dots, or actually 16 dots, depending on what it is. Uh, you, so that's something you know. And then with 2FA, you get uh, typically it's a text, it's the something you have. Now you could also have a mobile app, you know, like Google Authenticator. You could have a token, a hard token, anything like that, or just an, an SMS to your phone. So that's something you have. And it might seem a little difficult to get people used to it. It might uh, be hard for you to get used to it. But there are a lot of things that we do actually every day that falls in line with these different security requirements. If you think of all the things you do physically, physical security, before you leave the house, you make sure your burner's off, you make sure various lights are off, maybe heating sources are off. Uh, then you leave, you make sure your doorknob and your deadbolt are locked and make sure, sure your, uh, your car door is, uh, your uh, garage door is closed, your back door is closed, all the windows are locked. We do all these things. And this is how the 2FA uh, can become. And the more we get used to it, the easier it becomes, and then it becomes second nature. It just becomes a habit. So 2FA, whenever and whenever, wherever possible, I, I suggest train 2FA on, and enabling 2FA in Envoy. And it, it easily enables that. Uh, a great thing because uh, part of it, now we talked about doorknobs, of course that's your home, but when you're looking at Envoy, it increases the security need quite a bit because you're not just protecting your, your home goods, um, your, your, your own jewelry and thing. And those are valuable. Those are good. Everything in your house is good to protect. When we get into the corporate environment, we're looking at protecting other people's data too. We want to do everything we can to protect that. And with onboard, you're protecting the board minutes and all kinds of presentations, all kinds of uh, documents that we don't want anybody else to have. So the better we can protect it, the better off we are because we want to show people that we're doing everything we can 
to protect our company, our customers' data. So now Gina is yeah. going to show us some about 2FA and Onboard. Yeah, so let's take a look at this and Onboard. Um, this is a, a great extra measure um, of security that we can take um, in, uh, in Onboard to protect this information. Um, and there are two ways. One of them is we can enable this from our user profile. Now this will just um, affect your individual um, user profile. You'll come down here, like I said um, before, either to your initials or your photo um, in Onboard, and you'll click on that. It'll bring you to your user account information. You're just going to click on the Enable Two-Factor Authentication box, and it's going to, as you can see on the right-hand side, it says it's updated um, your, uh, my profile successfully. Then I'm going to add my mobile number here uh, just click here, type in your number, and click set number. Now, when I do this and I log into Onboard, it's going to ask for my username, my password, and then it's either going to email or text the phone number, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, six-digit PIN code to me. So this, this is where the extra layer of security um, comes in um, to play because it will, um, like I said, it will, it will require the username, the password, and um, this um, six-digit code uh, to be able to log into your onboard portal. The other way we can do this is coming to the landing page and going to the organization information. Now, only the admin will be able to do this for the uh, board portal. They will scroll down, uh, down to the bottom, and it'll say two-factor authentication here. They will click on this box to require the two-factor authentication for their entire, um, all of their users. Um, now that will require the user to um, also log in, as I had indicated before, um, with their username, their password, as well as this six-digit code being texted or emailed to them. Um, if we um, select the set exceptions, we can um, um, set a, a person here as an exception to this. Um, so they would not be required to um, use the two-factor authentication. So here, if we begin um, typing, it will um, guess who you are, uh, which user you want, and then you can just click add and submit. And so Denzel would not have to type in a, um, an extra user um, code to get into the board portal. So that is how, um, how easy it is to do the two-factor authentication and onboard. Okay. A couple questions from the audience. Okay. Um, they're not seeing the, that tool in their instance of onboard. Um, what uh, user groups or what uh, groups would include that functionality um, that maybe they don't have currently? Okay, and they're not seeing that user tool <coughs> in, in the organization control, the two-factor authentication. That okay. Okay, so for our audience attendees asking about the feature in Onboard, you have to be an administrator of your Onboard portal, and you have to be logged in through the browser, and then you would go to the organization info tab, and you should be able to see those settings. Mm -hmm. So for Nancy and Tanya, um, if you, um, if that answered your question or not, let us know. Yeah. I also think um, it also depends a little bit on the package you have. Uh, Two-factor authentication is not included with all onboard packages. If that's something you'd like, a uh, feature you'd like, to, uh, organizational control, two-factor authentication, I should say, is a, not a function of all the onboard packages. Uh, if that's something you'd like to discuss, reach out to your CSM and we can go over those options uh, for you um, and uh, discuss how we can get that turned on. Now, you can turn on two-factor authentication as an individual user. Gina, if you want to show yeah. how you can do that. Yeah, you just come back here control. to the, um, uh, to your user profile by clicking again on the initials on the left-hand side. And uh, it'll bring you over here to your user account. Um, and you'll be able to click on the enable two-factor authentication. This, like I said earlier, this just applies to your own um, board portal. Okay, does that answer all of the questions so far? Okay. 
I'm going to turn this back over to Ross then for our third um, security information tip. Okay, so we're going on to uh, using Onboard instead of email to distribute documents. Uh, so the advantages of that. Now, the reason this it might not seem like a security issue on the surface of things, but as we go through this, I think you'll see that it is uh, very definitely a security issue. So the first one, reducing data exposure through email. So this way you could reduce insider threat. Insider threat, it makes it sound like, uh, I, I, I don't like the term, it makes it sound like all your employees are bad people, but that's not really it. A lot of it is mistakes. Uh, so here, the data exposure through email, avoiding that, that mistake from inside. Um, a couple things. One, uh, you don't send things, you just don't, uh, if you have private documents, it, it's best not to send them through email. Uh, now this gets into the end-to-end -end encryption of, of how that can be done through email and there's a bunch of complexities involved. Uh, but in, in general, uh, just to the wider world, that can't be done. So you're sending documents uh, unencrypted, especially important documents. But it can also it, it reduce that exposure. If you're typing away, you've got this list or whatever, you've got um, um, so a bunch of people you're sending to, maybe even their home email address. What we're, we're talking about board members, potentially. It could be their home email address. But you're typing these in. What if you accidentally mistype? Like we've all probably done it. We've seen it, the type ahead feature. And oh yeah, this goes to, uh, I want to send this to Rob. But you, it actually auto fills with Ross and you, you choose to send it to me instead of your board member, Rob. And so there's data exposure. But in Onboard, you put it in Onboard, it's a central location where everybody can go to and you don't send anything through email. Now they will get a notification. They could be set up to get a notification that there's an update or something there, but the document isn't sent through it. Uh, file transfer issues. You may have, uh, depending on your company, depending on your organization, regulatory issues, uh, compliance requirements, you may have to do secure file transfer. And this would count for that. Instead of having to encrypt it or use WinZip or something to um, to encrypt it that way, zip it up, whatever it might be, or any other special software, you put it in onboard and it's secure there because it's a TLS connection. So eliminate attachment size failures. What if you send it to uh, someone at another company, another place, and you're sending a six meg file and they have a five meg limit? Well, suddenly they can't get it and you have to find a way around that. Uh, if you have your own in-house email servers, if you're sending a three meg document to 30 people, then you have 90 meg of, of, of just from that one email, 90 megs worth of files, of space on your server now. Whereas if you just put it in onboard, you have one three meg file and uh, those 30 people just get notified. Uh, eliminate different versions. You send out one version, somebody edits it and they send out another version. And who knows, within a week or three weeks, you've got 10 different versions and you don't remember which one came from who and who's supposed to have what and which is the final authority. So you have one version there and onboard. And uh, I referenced it earlier, no mailing list. Uh, you can make mailing list errors. You could do that. But what if you didn't have to have a mailing list where uh, maybe you send it to someone you shouldn't? Or you don't send it to someone who should have gotten them. Maybe your list is out of date. Out of date. Maybe you have 10 people who have 10 different mailing lists and uh, they're all over the place. So there's, uh, it eliminates the mailing list errors. And it makes access a lot easier. Instead of someone having to have their email right there or their tablet or their phone or be at their computer, they can get into Onboard uh, from anywhere. Instead of looking on their little screen, if, as long as they can get on the internet, then they can get to onboard. So, we're going to go to Gina. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Okay, we've got one more slide here. That's right. I forgot about this. Thinking of security, thinking of uh, having items in email uh, and various incidents. So, this is from 
March 25th, so just last, last month, uh, there were reported three email security incidents where at these different corp different companies, someone in the organization clicked on an email, they entered uh, their credentials where they shouldn't, and so the bad guys got access to those people's email addresses and their email boxes. And they got uh, PHI from those email boxes. Now, I know uh, we can't keep all, all PHI, all confidential stuff out of our email. We don't have complete access and we don't all have 2FA enabled, right? I know it can be a hassle corporate-wide, enterprise-wide, because it takes uh, for 2FA for everything. Uh, it takes money, it takes testing, it takes education, it takes the culture, the culture of the company, uh, the buy-in to get it going. But if anything we can do, do to reduce the amount of PII, PHI, EPHI that we have in our email, anytime we can use 2FA to, uh, if we accidentally, uh, people make mistakes. We have so much, you know, we have TMI all the time, too much information all the time, and things go really fast, and everybody can make a mistake. But if we do enter our credentials where we shouldn't, if it happens, if you have two FA turned on, then you have a chance to correct that. So anywhere you can use two FA, anytime you can reduce the amount of confidential information that you have in your email box, anytime you can do that, the better. So we're gonna to go to Gina now. Yeah, and so onboarding email. it's really helpful to utilize the group uh, feature in onboard. Uh, we always recommend that to eliminate um, uh, um, forgetting uh, people uh, to send the announcements to, or maybe your meetings to, uh, to make sure that they have received notice of um, the information that you are, uh, that you are posting in onboard and that you want for them to see. So we recommend coming down here to the directory on the left hand side and clicking on the directory and coming over here you've got members on the left these are your individual members and then your groups uh, there next to that and i've created a couple um, groups here um, to receive that i want to receive um, an announcement so um, you can name the group whatever you want i've got here an executive committee and I, I the description i put in there were the superstars um, and then i've got a celebrity committee so i'm going to just give you an example um, because we want um, we want a very um, a predetermined um, group to uh, receive this announcement um, and um, and to make sure we haven't forgotten anyone um, so we're going to come over here to our landing page um, or dashboard um, we're going to click on the announcement and uh, you'll come up and you'll see the announcement here. Um, I have uh, chosen this announcement because I've made some um, amendments to my April meeting that I want all of my users to read. So I'm going to go to the edit announcement and I'm going to scroll down. I've included a link that will take my members, my group members directly to where they can look at these meeting amendments. Um, and I want these two groups to see this announcement. So I've, I've uh, loaded in the executive committee. I'm also going to click on my celebrity committee. Uh, and then on the upper right hand corner, I'm going to click send. And that will send an email to these individuals. Um, it's a predetermined set of individuals. So like Ross said, I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, I know exactly who um, these users are that are getting this announcement. So on, on their email, they will receive an announcement um, that looks similar to this. Um, and it's just a general um, announcement, just saying that um, an announcement titled April board, board meeting uh, book amendments has been added. And it won't give them any information in their email, but they will see that they need to come to onboard um, and review that information um, and um, and look and take a look at that. So that's um, how we um, leverage the groups. And like I said, we do recommend um, using that feature in onboard. Um, and um, we hope that you found these security tips helpful. Um, uh, today and I thank Ross for his time. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, we have one last user question uh, from Kathy. 
Uh, Kathy wants to know if they, as an organization, force their users to reset passwords. Uh, does Onboard prevent them from reusing the same password? And to be perfectly honest, I, it's pretty rare people stump me, but that's a darn fine question. I don't think I've ever run into that before. Uh, so uh, I thought we'll throw that out to the panel. If uh, does Onboard prevent people from recycling uh, passwords if they're reset? So this is Jenny Washington, uh, one of the Onboard implementation managers. And um, currently with Onboard, if you do forget your password and need to reset your password or you are required to reset your password, um, you can recycle and reuse passwords currently. So that might be something that we can look at in the future. Would love to get feedback from you um, as part of our own security practices. Yeah, Corinne, uh, Corinne uh, uh, she verifies that from her personal experience with Onboard. Uh, so excellent, that's, uh, uh, yeah, great that's, question. that's a good question and that's, uh, that's a great uh, enhancement that we can look forward to uh, uh, debating and implementing. Uh, Lori asked if this uh, material will be available after the, enter, uh, at the webinar. Absolutely, Lori. We're going to put this uh, webinar online, uh, the recording, uh, along with the links uh, for the, uh, uh, the data that we're sharing. So that will be available for you uh, as uh, that you attended. We'll make sure we'll, we'll send you. Uh, and I believe that covers just about everything. Um, uh, excellent. Okay. Uh, that's all our user questions. Um, yeah, and I know that um, we have some resources for further information. Um, yes, so some uh, the article is at the top. Uh, some other things for uh, like haven't been haven't been pwned or haven't been ponded, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, a lot of great information there for you uh, to check on your email, even to check a password if you have a password idea to see if actually if actually it has been used. There are about 500 million passwords that are, have been, that are known, that have been breached, that are in this big database out and about. So you can see if it's out there. Uh, the password task, password managers. This is a open organization of lock pickers. Uh, it's great to learn about these locks because it, um, I, I've enjoyed lock picking, lock sport. Some people don't like lock picking, lock sport myself. A good way to learn about some basic security practices, how things can, can be broken and why you need to have it better. Uh, the password finder, password test, two-factor auth list. Uh, if you wonder if whatever service you're using uh, uses 2FA, if it enabled, you can go out there and search for it. And then Verizon's DBI, DBIR is always a great resource of lots of information. And again, this is just a handful of things um, take and leave uh, as, as you wish. And, uh, but yeah, if you wanna delve into those to help you increase the security of uh, both your, your own life but also your organization. Mm -hmm. Thanks Ross. And we will also be um, hosting an April 18th coffee break. Um, and this is uh, regarding security awareness also. And we welcome you to um, register for this um, training and, and coffee break. Bring your coffee. We'd love to see you at this one as well. So um, we hope you are all um, having a great day and that you've learned something valuable today to, um, to use and onboard and, and in your own uh, personal maybe uh, banking um, and, and your own personal emails. So it's, uh, security is very important. We hope you have a great day. Thank you, everybody.